In this session, we're going to be exploring uh, Jupyter Notebooks for uh, visualization. So uh, we'll be, uh, Joe and I, uh, will be showing you some uh, use cases. Uh, specifically, Joe will be showing uh, visualization of, of 2D potential flow around a nerve hole. Uh, and you've probably, you've probably seen this data before. Um, so this is the data that uh, Cyrus uh, showed before. Uh, so Joe will be showing how to use um, Matplotlib uh, uh, libraries uh, to um, do this in the context of, of a Jupyter notebook. Right? Uh, the second case, uh, I'll be showing uh, in situ, uh, ex an example of in situ visualization, uh, in this case with Sensei and uh, Leipzig backend. Um, the idea here uh, is, is to uh, propose to use Jupyter Notebooks as a tool, right, to drive your simulations, uh, prepare the environment to run your simulation, uh, submit the job, and collect the results, right? And everything should be self-contained uh, in the notebook. So that, that's the idea we're, we're going to propose here. Um, uh, so, essentially, for this, we will be using a um, singularity container, and we'll run it on Cooley. Uh, so you'll see how to submit the job, prepare everything, and uh, collect the in situ images generated and uh, create an animation, a video that, at the same time, will be part of the notebook. So to get started, uh, you can uh, download this, uh, uh, the slides. Uh, but the, the idea here is that you copy the data in the project directory, right? Um, copy this directory uh, and make a copy on, on your home directory on Cooley, okay? So it's important to use the dash R to make it recursive, right? So, oh, sorry, I have two ones there. That should be a point number two there. Uh, once you have the copy, uh, create uh, or start a Jupyter session, right? So you just point your browser to uh, jupyter.alcf.anl.gov. Uh, it will give you two options, Theta or Cooley. Just select Cooley there. Uh, then you use, enter your username and password, the usual thing you do with your crypto key, right? A pin plus uh, the crypto key code. Uh, and from Jupyter, uh, just navigate to the, the directory that you copied in, in the previous point, right? It's, that directory should be called at pesk 2019 Jupyter. There you will find the two notebooks that, that we will be covering today, right? Can you tell us what's in, what, what's in that directory? There's, there should be two? In that directory, there, there should be two notebooks, right? Uh, and additional... Uh, things that, that you will need, like a uh, frames directory that it's empty now, but uh, the second notebook will be generating content in that frames directory. But essentially, you should find two notebooks. The extensions of the notebooks <laughs> is I, Pi, and B. Right, and then the, the data that'll get used for the, the MFAM um, data, uh, also lives in a project directory off of here, um, but the, the path is in the notebooks. So you don't need to worry about changing that. So that should be the contents of the directory that you copied, right? So once you launch Jupyter, you should end up in this page, uh, or actually you, will, you may need to click in that folder, at pesk 2019 Jupyter, and you will see this. Right, so when you go to, to jupyter.alcf.anl.gov, and select Cooley and log in, that'll put you in your home directory on Cooley. Um, and so, and actually we're gonna run in a couple different modes. And, and for this one, there's, so when you create a, a, a Jupyter session under Cooley, that's on a dedicated node for Cooley, um, which, so it has access to the Cooley file system and whatnot, but essentially everyone's running on the same node. And so for the first notebook, we'll do some stuff that we're basically just running um, on that node, on, on that head node, essentially. And, and for yours, we're going to submit jobs. Is that right? We're going to submit 
job just right. for the second. Right. So for the second one, um, you'll actually submit a job and it'll run, um, you know, so it'll submit a job from that, that essentially head node um, and the, the, the code will actually run on one of the viz nodes, back end nodes of the cluster. Right, so is everyone here? Right, so from your home directory, you should be able to navigate to this at PESC uh, Jupyter directory. Um, and we're gonna start with this MFEM airfoil visualization IPI notebook. So if you just click on that, it'll open up a Jupyter notebook. So again, so the data for this, uh, this is a potential flow visualization example. It's a 2D data example. It's taken um, from the uh, fast math team that's gonna be here tomorrow. Uh, this is the same data set uh, that, that Cyrus showed a little bit earlier um, using Visit. In fact, um, the way I generated this data was I took, I loaded up the raw data from the simulation into Visit um, and then extracted it. You saw how busy that, that mesh was. Um, so I took that data, um, projected it onto a regular grid, um, and because things are so dense around the airfoil, um, I projected it at, at 2K resolution and, and saved that to disk. And then I went back and um, basically cropped it to a 1K square image. So the data that we're gonna load is basically a 1K by 1K, um, just a binary array. Um, and so there's actually, the, there's actually two different um, data sets that are associated with it. And there's a couple of variables for each um, we're just going to look at one of them right now. Um, and you can see here where the path to the other one is. So we'll look at actually the same data that, um, that Cyrus looked at, which was this uh, parameter sweep over the, the angle. Um, but there was also another, uh, another pass through the data um, that changed the velocity magnitude. Um, and that data is also there in this path. Um, and so if you want to look at that later, uh, you're welcome to do that. Um, but so for the first session, the, this particular one, right, so we have a handful of, um, of libraries that, we need, that we're going to use, so we're going to need to import those. Um, we have to back up a little bit. Is anyone not familiar with Jupyter? Okay, so we have a few people. Okay. Um, so there's, uh, in the interface, what we're seeing is that we have a, basically a number of different cells, and each of these cells can be either code, which is um, what this one is here. Um, in fact, I'm gonna go up to here and say, clear all output just so that it's not there. Um, right, and so you can see that, you know, this says that this one is code. If I go down, or actually if I go back up to this, this top one, um, it's, uh, markdown, which is essentially just a, um, a syntax for, for, actually if I double click this, you'll see what, this is what the raw markdown looks like. It's similar to HTML, you have a um, syntax for creating, this is a, um, a title, um, you can add links and such. And so to execute a cell, you say, um, well on the Mac it's control, and control return, um, or you could um, uh, press, the run, uh, press the run button to, to run that cell. So for Markdown, it just basically does the formatting for you. Um, so the first thing we'll do is we'll import a number of, of the uh, libraries we need. So we'll go ahead and run this, shell, uh, this cell, right? And I print that out, you know, imports complete, so we knew that that um, cell actually ran. You notice now that there's this number one here, right? So that indicates that this cell has now been run. Um, while it's running, it shows an asterisk there. So for, for cells that take some, some amount of time to run, um, you'll see that be, uh, see the asterisk there until it, it completes. Um, and then the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, define some paths, right? So I mentioned all this data uh, lives in the project directory for the for for AdPesk. Um, that's this long path here, and so we're going to find define this as as the data directory, 
Um, and then early on here, we're just going to use the first time step. Uh, as I mentioned, this isn't actually time varying. It's some other, it's uh, angle varying. Um, but so for the, the, the first uh, data step that we're going to look at, um, define that uh, data file. And we'll do a bunch of stuff on just this one file to start. And so again, control, enter, or return, we'll run that cell. Um, and then initially, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to just read this into a, a NumPy array. Uh, and I happen to know that this is 32-bit float, um, so I'm going to tell it that that's the type. I think by default, it assumes that it's double. I learned that the hard way. Oops. Right, and so I said print out the array. So from that, um, I can see that I have a one-dimensional array with a bunch of values. And again, it tells me that this is the type that we used. Um, so we can also use the, the shape command to find out uh, more information about its dimensions. Right, so in this case, again, it's 1D array, so it's you know, a million or so by one. Right, but we're, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this, this essentially 1D array and make it into a 2D array of 1024 by 1024 so that we could then feed that into the plotting, uh, the figure uh, code. And so uh, we can use this reshape command. Um, and so it's basically gonna return um, a newly formatted reshape uh, NumPy array. Right, and it told us what its dimensions are now. Right, because I ran this uh, shape command again, and now we can see that it's 1024 by 1024. So we'll first create a simple plot. Um, basically, figure size, for all practical purposes, sets the size and aspect ratio um, of it, and then this IM show will show this, um, show the data. All right, so here's a simple look at, at, at it initially. Um, should look somewhat familiar, right? We saw this airfoil in, in the data that, uh, that Cyrus was looking at. You can see that the, it's 1024 by 1024. Um, this image is a little bit, well, on this screen it's kind of big, but on, on your local one it's probably small. So we're gonna increase the size. So basically I just made the figure size now 20 by 20. I'll run it again. All right, so now we can see things in a little bit more detail. Unfortunately, we can't see all of it on the screen at one time. Um, right, and, and so we're not seeing a whole lot of detail here, right? And if we look at the, if we scroll back up, we can see what um, some of those data values were, right? They're all sort of in and around, um, in and around one or give or take, between zero and one. Um, but if you remember when, when we were looking at the mesh with Cyrus, the, the, the part where the airfoil was, was actually empty. It wasn't part of the mesh itself. And so when we projected that onto a, onto a regular grid, um, those cells ended up with some value, right? And so to differentiate from the rest of the field, um, I assigned a value of negative 1,000 to that space, right? And so because the data range is, uh, the real data range is essentially between zero and one, and now it's, the color scale it's using is trying to, to project it into the range of negative thousand to one. We're losing all the detail, where, right, where things matter. So um, in this next cell, um, this PLT, right, and so maybe I should say a little bit more about, so PLT is, um, is, uh, the, the matplotlib pi plot module that we imported, right? So we can import these um, different modules as essentially shortened names, and PLT is sort of the convention um, for using, for, for that we use for matplotlib. 
Um, so again, I'm going to scroll back down. And, and so here, um, I'm saying limit the color um, scale to use, go from, instead of negative 1,000, go from negative 1 um, to 0.5. Um, and you'll notice that in the, the comments, so right, anything with a hash mark is a, it, is a comment. Um, it says uh, for P, so we're looking at pressure, right? So the data file, the, the list of the files that we're going to open now is for pressure. Um, there's also um, the velocity magnitude is another field that's stored in a different file um, in that same directory. And so um, I'll leave that also as an exercise for the user if you want to go and poke around at that data. Um, but so for now, we'll, we'll change the, the scale uh, for this pressure data. All right, so now you can see a lot more detail, because right, we've essentially filtered out or clamped the data range to be um, in this sort of known good range of values. Is this working for everybody? All right, great. Um, so here I'm going to change the color map instead of using this default one that we got. Um, I'm going to say use the red blue. Um, and so red blue goes from red to blue, but in, I, I want it to go from blue to red instead. So we use the underscore R reverses that. And again, I'm still using the telling it to use this um, smaller scale of values. Didn't highlight the right side. Okay. All right, so this is what the result of that is. All right, so we can go ahead and add um, um, some titles and other annotation and, and labels. So there's um, PLT title and X label and Y label. And did I skip something here? Feels like I'm missing a cell. Um, yeah, so I think I may have deleted a cell here, but th this is essentially um, doing two things. The, the, we, we added the labels, as you can see in the image now. Um, but the other thing is that we changed the extents. Right, so originally it was listing essentially the resolution of the, of the data set, which was um, essentially by the number of pixels or voxels, right? Um, zero to 1023. Um, but I know the, the, the region that I cropped actually goes from negative 2.5 to positive 2.5 in both X and Y. And so that's what this extents is doing, right? So now if we look at the um, at the axis, we can see it's been relabeled to be, you know, negative 2.5 to 2.5. Um, since this is really hard to read, I'm going to make the font a little bigger. And so that's what this couple of lines here is going to do. Uh, comment? Yeah, yes. So um, the units for fig size are inches. And if you want to scale the plot up without having to fix the font size, you can just give it a DPI argument. Oh, sure. Yeah. So that would probably be a better way to do it. Um, and actually, it looks like this guy. Got dropped from here. Um, I see. Okay. Um, we're also going to uh, add a color bar to the right side. Got to highlight that cell. And 
for some reason, again, I must have, oh, it did there. So somehow I dropped this extent argument from the, from the show, and so this, um, these subsequent ones are, are back to using the other scale, so I'm gonna add that back in. Right, um, so the, the other thing to note is that, remember, we're, we're actually using, we're, we're clamping the scale of the data a little bit. And so to indicate that, um, oops. Where is the thing that does that? Oh, here it is. Um, uh, we indicate, uh, God, what? I guess I wasn't as um, thorough about cleaning up this notebook as I thought. Um, so because we're, we're extending the scale um, by adding this, um, this plot color bar extend in both directions, um, it adds these arrows to the color bar so that we can see that we're actually um, showing a subset of the full data range. Um, oh, I guess here's where I actually had the thing where I added in the, the extents. Um, right. So sorry, that was a little bit out of order. Um, right. And so the, one of the last things we'll do here is there's um, 61 steps in this time series. So um, we're gonna uh, essentially create a movie that we could then play back in the browser here. Um, so again, now that we've imported all of these libraries, we shouldn't need to do them again, but um, for example, if you were to start this notebook and jump directly to, to the creating the movie part, you would need to import these. So I'm gonna, just for good measure, I'm gonna re-import all these things. Again, I'm defining the path. Um, and so now we're gonna uh, loop over all the steps um, uh, and, and reading the data and plot it. Um, since we want um, a single instance of the color bar, we're only gonna do that um, the first time through. Otherwise, we'll add a color bar at each time step and you'll end up with all these um, sort of nested color bar things. Right, and so that created it. Um, and so now if we go down to this, uh, the next cell, um, this will generate um, an HTML, a thing that we can import, uh, display uh, in the HTML. And this may take some time. Yeah, so this will take a little bit longer. So it's essentially going to combine all of the images that it made into uh, an animation. All right, so it completed. It's going to take a second to show up here. Usually doesn't take that long. What's up with that? There it is. Got nervous there for a second. Um, right, and then you can see down at the bottom here. There's a the normal sort of VCR controls. You can say either you know to loop it or just play it once. And so now if we play that. Right, it's essentially looping over those 60 steps, animating through. Is everyone able to get that much to work? All right, cool.
pause that. Um, so another thing we might want to do, right, is, so here we're looking at the, this 2D plot, but um, we might want to do some statistical analysis of this data, right? So um, in this next little, uh, basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, create and actually, oh, I see what we did. Um, I'm going to loop over all the time steps um, and for each one, I'm going to find uh, the max, min, and the mean values for each of those. And, and then essentially add them to, the, to this list, you know, one for each. So I'll go ahead and run this cell. Right, and so we're, we're finding the, for each of those time steps, with the max val value, and for the minimum values, you'll notice all of them are negative 1,000, right? That's the this dummy value that I use to indicate where the, um, the airfoil is. So I really, and that's also obviously going to skew the values for the mean, and um, we can also do average. And so um, what I'm going to do instead is um, basically exclude everything that's that's negative 1,000. So using this, lo this um, syntax, I can say, basically create a data array, a new data array, I'll call it cleaned data, um, from the data array where the values are not equal to 1,000, to negative 1,000. Um, and then I'll append those to my lists um, and calculate those values. And, I, and again, here I added average into that as well. Right, so now we can see the, the min values are more on the um, range of, what is it? I guess the lowest one is negative 60-ish or so, right? Much different than the, the um, 1,000, and that obviously changes the mean and all the, these other values as well. Um, and then we'll just do a simple plot of well, first we'll just do the max, right? And so here's a plot of um, the maximum value over um, that series. It's not actually, again, it's not time. It's um, the, uh, the, the angle of, of the, the velocity angle. Right, and then, so in order to plot these other values on the same chart, I can basically just uncomment um, these other values and run, right? Because the, the range, is, again, is so much wider with these other values, I commented them out initially, so you could see that the, um, that max value was fluctuating quite a bit, but within, obviously, very small range. Um, so that's the sort of the basics that I wanted to kind of step through. Um, there's, I'll you know, leave this as an exercise to add labels and, and do some of the other things. Um, and, and again, um, I encourage you to, to look through um, this and the other couple of data sets that are there. Again, the, um, the, the path is up here at the top of the notebook. Right, so this, the, again, there's sort of two series of data, um, and they each have two variables. Um, and we saw in the, you know, the, the file names we were using for, for this time around was for the pressure, so it has P in the name. If it's, uh, there's also one that uses V for velocity. Um, and so I encourage you to go take a look at that, some of that data as well. Um, any questions about any of this stuff? Yeah. yeah I was wondering, what, uh, when you run the JSON HTML function, where does it generate the, the thing that you can put in an HTML page? Because I run it, but I don't see it in my directory. Anyway. So it's, it's all in memory. There's an, there's, you can add other functions to actually write the images out to disk, right? But it's not actually writing those out. Oh, right. It's just storing it in memory. So, but there is an option to actually dump it into a file. 
if I want to put it later in another HTML page? Yes. Yeah. Anything else before I hand it over to Silvio? Okay, so one thing I should also point out though is if we go back to, oh, I guess I excluded this, right? So if you, um, for those that aren't familiar um, with Jupyter, if we go back to, the, to the, the, your starting page, you have this list of files and running. If you switch over to running, you'll see that this notebook is still currently running, right? So, um, and it's taking up memory, including all the stuff for the, that animation. Right, and so we should go and, and go ahead and say shut down. So that will free up the memory and the resources that are being used by that notebook. Um, and so I'll leave it at that. And this guy, and I'm gonna go ahead and close that. All right, so back on in that Jupyter directory, um, I'll let Silvio talk about the other notebook that's there. So um, let's uh, start this notebook, the Sensei, Sensei LibSim. And uh, again, as I, as I mentioned uh, in the introduction, this is about illustrating um, a simple example of running in situ. This is, is a mini app that comes with Sensei. It's, uh, and there's, there's a little bit more details uh, here. Uh, it's an atomic oscillator uh, mini app, right? Um, and it generates a regular grid, uh, but it also supports particle and, and an, an unstructured grid. So essentially what we're going to do is configure the mini app to run. We'll give it some parameters for, for the uh, atomic oscillators. Um, we are going to generate an XML file for Sensei to activate LiveSim as a backend. Uh, remember that in, in the previous, in the morning talk, uh, I showed some XML examples, right? So we're gonna illustrate some of those here, we'll, and we'll be generating those here. So. That is going to tell Sensei to activate LiveSim and pass data to it. Uh, and the, the kind of thing that, that we want to do with LiveSim, which is essentially generating slices. They're going to look like this. Um, and then uh, we are going to create a script, a bash script, to submit this job. Uh, we're we're going to put it in the queue, uh, run it, and then collect the, the images that are generated in situ. So we're going to be running it for 50 time steps. Something simple, but, uh, that, is, uh, but uh, that is good to illustrate how it works. So another interesting thing here is that um, we will be running everything in a singularity container. Right? Building these infrastructures, uh, the, the in situ infrastructures, is, is a non-trivial problem, right? So um, building visit from source may take some time, building pair view from source may take some time. So one thing that we're trying to do is, is to create um, singularity containers that everyone can use, right? And then that can illustrate, um, or that can serve uh, as, as the purpose of, of being uh, a bootstrap for you to just put your code there and everything else is there. Um, so the Container that we're using uh, is, is built with mpage. Uh, then we have visit uh, 2.13.3. It's not the latest version, but this is the one that, that uh, works uh, with Sensei in its current version. Um, and it also has Adios uh, 1.13.1, again, not the latest version, um, with FlexPath as a transport. So you could be using all this uh, infrastructures, uh, in situ infrastructures there. And finally, it's, it's got Sensei 2.1.1. So the container is again in the project directory, and, and you're seeing the path there. In case you want to copy it, it it's a big file, but if you like to copy it uh, and, and try it somewhere else, you're welcome to do that. And I can share, I didn't put the recipe here, the, the singularity uh, recipe here, but I can share it if, if anyone is interested. So 
This is what we're going to do. Point one, we will run the mini app uh, and give it the configuration file. Uh, point two, we're going to generate the XML uh, file for Sensei. Uh, point three, uh, we, we'll run the simulation, put it in the queue, run it. It, it should run in, in, in less than a minute, in under a minute. Uh, so it, it will be generating images in situ. So we will grab those 50 frames and create a movie that at the same time we're going to uh, embed in the notebook. Right? So this is, this is the idea, right? using the notebook to drive the entire process. Right? And this, if, if you will be doing research, this is, this is probably an interesting workflow to try. You can put everything here in your notebook, uh, even the, the configuration files, uh, the settings needed, needed to run on a given machine, and at the same time collect the results of your simulation. Right? In this case, we're, we're showing images that we're collecting in situ. But at the same time, you will see there are some files containing uh, benchmarking information or profiling information. Right? So you, you could be also collecting that and doing some uh, plots. Of, of your performance, right? Uh, so everything in a single notebook, and then you can share it with your collaborators. So uh, we're, we're going to start by defining these two variables that we will need to run the jobs, right? Don't modify them, please. Uh, and in fact, uh, I'm just going to do restart and clear output to start from a clean state. So let's run this first. Uh, sorry, I should have done this. And in this cell that I'm pointing, make sure to enter your username and call it, right? So that's my username. And the notebook that uh, you received, this should be blank. So make sure to add your username there because that's what uh, we're, we're going to need that. In fact, uh, we're going to, I think we're going to need it here in the next cell to create uh, some uh, variables and some paths. So let's run this. Uh, and, and you can see that this is pointing to your home directory. Uh, we are defining a directory where uh, the simulation is, uh, or the LiveSim, in fact, is, is going to write uh, rendered frames. So this is going to be its directory. Uh, this is the file name of the video that we're going to create. Then the configuration XML file is going to be called oscillator.xml. Uh, the parameters for the atomic oscillators will be in this sample.osc file. And the file that we will put in the queue is going gonna, is gonna to be called creatively script.shell. Uh, you don't need to run the next cell. This is if, in case you, uh, you run it before and want to clean up the previous results. So there's no need to run this for now. Uh, and in the next cell, we are going to create an XML config file for Sensei. So uh, this is what it looked like, what it looks like, right? <coughs> the, XM, the interesting XML part is here. We are telling the Sensei configurable analysis adapter that we want LiveSim as the backend with this line. Uh, we're telling it that we want to execute it in every time step. So there was a question in the previous section about executing it uh, in every uh, given number of time steps. So if, if you wanted to do that, let's say 10, uh, get, a, get an image, create an image every 10 time steps, you, you uh, put a 10 here. Uh, then we need to tell the adapter the, where to find visit or where to find the binaries for LiveSim. And this is a directory within the container. right? So this, this is where visit lives in the container. And we're telling it that it's going to be batch mode. It's, it's not going to be interactive or, or anything else. Uh, so what we're going to do here is essentially write slices. Uh, and if I scroll here a bit, these are the parameters for the slices, right? So the origin and the, the normal for the slice. 
Well, on many other parameters, right? Like, like image format is going to be PNG, and I want it to be 800 by 800 pixels. And the file name, which contains, uh, receives as a parameter the directory where the frames are going to live. So essentially, this will be creating uh, files named slice with the number the, uh, representing the time step here with extension PNG. So let's run this cell. And we can verify the file just doing a cut with the OS. So the file looks right to me, uh, and, and now it lives in my home directory. So similarly, we can set up the simulation. Uh, and these are the parameters that, that we're going to use for the atomic oscillators. Uh, I don't have, uh, I don't know exactly what they do. I just got this from an example, so don't ask me. But I know that it's, it's configuring uh, uh, atomic oscillators to do something. And again, we can verify that the file exists in our file system. So it's there and it's ready. And now we're going to uh, create a, a bash script to run this. So, so this is the, the, the file that we're going to uh, pass to Cobalt, the, the scheduler on Cooley. Uh, we're setting some environment variables here. Remember I mentioned that, that we can collect uh, benchmarking or profiling information? Well, we can do it through this variable. So defining this environment variables here. Uh, local bindings for uh, singularities. So we're telling singularity to mount this to uh, directories, because otherwise uh, things may fail. Uh, the singularity image, this is the path for it. We will be running in two ranks, single node, two ranks, and, and feel free to change this number, right? So uh, up to 12 uh, on Cooley. And then something I forgot to do when I built the image was to add this path, right? Or I found out later that this path <coughs> was missing, but you can fix it by defining this environment variable, right? Everything you, you do with singularity env uh, and an underscore will define, will pass that variable to singularity. So with that, we fix the problem of the, that missing path. And finally, the MPI exec uh, line, right? Um, which you may be familiar already with this. So let's just execute that cell. It's important for Cobalt to make it executable, to make that file executable. So let's change its permissions. And let's make sure it looks right in the file system. So it's there, and it should be doing the right thing. So it's time to run it now. So with this, this following cell, we will be doing a queue sub, putting it in the queue. So is the extent of what a singularity container is supposed to do is just load the correct modules and set paths? Is that like? A singularity is running an, an image, right? So it's, it, it contains an entire operating system, oh, right? Nice. The node will be running that operating system that you build inside the image. Conceptually, this is similar to a virtual machine. I see. I see. Uh, similar. It's not exactly the same. Why right? <laughs> right. But it's essential. So, the advantage of it is that you don't need to care about the local libraries that are on your HPC resource with this. You build your own operating system, you put everything you need inside it, and then you run it. And then you can move it from one facility to another. That's another advantage. And that, that's why we're proposing this. Right? So at ALCF, we support singularity. In other uh, HPC centers, they have uh, other uh, environments like Shifter at NERSC, uh, if I'm not mistaken. 
but essentially container technology uh, it is here and, it, and, and we should use it. Right? So let's, let's put the job in the queue with this line. It's going to be a single node right, for 10 minutes. And the number there is your job ID. Right? So now we can look, look at the queue. Uh, it is there. It's still not executing. And you can execute a, a cell many times to multiple times to see what's, uh, what's going on. At some point, hopefully, it will execute. Yes, that should be active. Let's, let me verify that it's active. It is active for three more hours. Let me see if there are nodes. There are nodes there. Let's look at the queue. There are a number ahead of me, so that's the reason. <laughs> but this is, this is, this is quick. Uh, that, that it should take on no more than a minute to execute all of them. So, so there should be a node right there for everybody, so yeah. it doesn't take any time Right. Well, but this, this is a real, a real experiment, right? So. Has anyone else's job started to run yet? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. Right, because that doesn't take effect until you're actually through the queue. Right. So. Well, this this will eventually execute. Uh, then you can use a cell. Uh, this cell to, when it's executing, actually look at the frames. So in this case, it, my frame directory is empty. Uh, when it's executing, it should start generating PNG files there. So we we'll still have five minutes, so hopefully I'll be able to complete this. All right. It's so starting now. So at some point, it will change to running. And while it's running, now I can check that it should be generating frames. There we go. So when it gets to 50 frames, it will be done. Close. Yeah, and I'm saying slice 50 there. So if, if I check my job, it should be, it ended already, right? So I have the frames. The job concluded, I have the frames. So now we can create a video with FFmpeg. So just uh, pass some parameters to FFmpeg, telling it that uh, uh, the, the frames that I'm going to use, uh, the frame rate I want. And it should give me this. This is quick to generate. So that's the output. And now I can grab that video. And let me reduce uh, sizes here. So I have the video now, and I can play it. And this is what LiveSim generated in situ.
right? So in a single uh, notebook, we have everything we need to run the job, to set, set up the job, run it, and collect the results, right? So that, that's one of the points that, that we wanted to illustrate, right? So if I wanted to reproduce this, I just need to give you my container, this notebook, and that's all you need, right? So that's what, what we're trying to promote, okay? Any questions? Yes? How portable is that singularity image? How? Is it, is it portable? Can I write on another, another system? Yes, yes. In fact, this, this is, is being tested on Cooley and uh, Theta, which are different systems. I, I've not tried that in, in, in other uh, facilities, right? But, uh, but it should be portable. Yes, yes. So how does the container work on different systems if the underlying architectures are different and you may need different compilers to actually target those chips? Well, there, there are, um, it, it's got to be, an, I think, an x86 machine. Uh, for uh, the operating system, I think it's got to be a, a, a flavor of Linux or, or Unix. Uh, and there are some things uh, uh, to, to keep in mind. So, for example, uh, you want to use the MPI libraries provided by the vendor, right? Not the ones you compile with. But if, 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 if you saw my, my notes, I built it with MPI there. So there are some tricks to substitute the one that you built with with the one in the uh, operating system provided by the vendor. If you Google Theta containers or Theta Singularity ALCF, you will find a, a, a lot, a, a very uh, detailed explanation of the things that, that, that we need to do to build containers on, on Theta. And some of those things are applicable in, in other facilities too, right? Yes? So then in this case, why did you build the container with MPI if you are going to use Be the Because the other things that I build inside the container are expecting to find MPI, right? So it, it's a dynamic. I, I'm building MPI as a dynamic library, but when the things, when Singularity runs, it substitutes uh, all the MPI libraries with the, the ones provided by uh, the vendor. And how difficult is it to set it from scratch? Like if I want to build a new singularity image with my own... It, it takes some iterations. It takes some time, right? But there are many uh, base images that you can build on, right? And, and, we, and, and people are building this and posting them, so there, there's a singularity hub where you can perhaps find what you're looking for, or at least something that is close to what you need. All right. So you can take a preview one yes. and keep adding things? Right. And yes. And it, uh, Singularity also supports Docker. And Docker is a more popular uh, container technology, right? So uh, there's a lot of existing images there that you can reuse. Yes. Any other questions? Yes. Um, I'm not sure, uh, but. Do you know um, what kind of resources you're dedicating to the Jupyter server and like, try to prevent bad actors on it? I don't know. I know it's a beefy node. It's a single node. It's connected to Cooley and, um, uh, of course, uh, using its file system, right? So that's how you're seeing your home directory is there. But I don't know how it's being set up. Okay. Uh, however, uh, uh, I can put you in contact with our admins, so they know everything about uh, Jupyter. Uh, yeah. Obviously, you're, you're logging in with your credentials, so <laughs> right. They, you know, so they know who's running what, right? I mean, so if you're going to do some bad act, they know it's you. <laughs> right. Well, the other thing you can do is essentially use a node. Um, we have some documentation to use a node on Cooley to stand up your own Jupyter server. Right? Uh, it will live as long as your session is active, though, but uh, it may still help. Uh, so if, if you have a, your own setup, right, uh, or your own cluster, you may use a node to launch or stand up your own uh, Jupyter server there. Right. And then in that case, it's not a shared resource, right? right? You have exclusive access to that node. Right. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you.